have the, uh, the Dutch uh, royal family as the, the warm-up act uh, to prevent, uh, we're, we're partly beneficiaries from a visit that they did yesterday, so uh, uh, we're lucky to be in this, uh, in this beautiful space, and the room is, is really nicely set up. Uh, very excited to have you here. Thank you very much for uh, devoting some or all of your uh, Saturday to uh, the issue of better budgeting in Toronto. Uh, this is our second uh, Better Budget Day. Our first one was in the fall of uh, 2013, and we're really, really excited to do a follow-up uh, today now that we have a new um, administration at City Hall, a new term of council, and uh, you know it's, it's great to see uh, this kind of turnout at this event and this number of people interested in this issue. Um, I want to do a, a little bit of a quick overview of the day. Uh, I think each of you should have received a couple of items in your registration kit, uh, one of which is uh, basically a schedule for the day, and on the back is a list of eight workshops that will be taking place this afternoon in various rooms. Um, but uh, just to quickly give you a sense of what we're going to be doing today, um, the morning uh, program is basically a quick introduction to the topic of budgeting and to the work that we're trying to do uh, at Better Budget TO. Uh, we're going to have a very special panel on the politics of budgeting, basically budgeting from the perspective of uh, elected officials. And then we're going to wrap up the morning with uh, the results of our review of the 2015 budget process, uh, which you should also have in your registration packages, uh, the executive summary from that piece of work. Now we're going to have lunch um, in this room, and so uh, it's a free lunch. Uh, there's lots of great food out at the farmer's market, but uh, lunch is provided as part of the program as well. And then in the afternoon, we're going to have a series of uh, workshops on uh, different topics related to the budget. There's a description of each of the workshops in the back of uh, the program, but basically what's going to happen is each workshop is going to take place twice, uh, once at 1 o'clock and again at 2 o'clock. So you, you can basically pick two workshops and, and try out two different topics uh, to basically help discuss and build some skills around uh, some of these some of these topics. Uh, so that's that's basically uh, the program. Uh, we also have a uh, hashtag for the event, uh, which is BBD2015. Uh, we tried to find a unique hashtag. Uh, it turns out that this one is also the same hashtag as Belgian Beer Day. <laughs> so, um, you know, there may be a little bit of cross-pollination of ideas, uh, but, um, you know, uh, that may come into play at the reception at the end of the day. The one thing I did mention as part of the, the program is that we are going to have a social uh, after the second workshop wraps up at around uh, 3 o'clock, a little bit after 3 o'clock, over at Cafe Belong, which is, which is on this facility right here. So, if, if we encourage you to stick around. Hopefully the weather will hold out uh, and uh, we'll have a chance to, uh, to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, we've got a great partner in this event, uh, which is Evergreen City Works. And uh, I just want to introduce uh, John Broadhead, who is the Executive Director of Evergreen City Works and uh, our partner for this event. Uh, I got to know John working in the uh, provincial government. And uh, you know, John has a bit of a reputation uh, as, uh, as somebody who can get things done. And to mobilize, uh, so I have a couple of reputations. A couple of different <laughs> reputations, uh, but uh, kind of to make things happen. He's got a real passion for innovation and city building. Uh, his background is uh, before he, he took on this assignment, uh, he had a number of roles in the provincial government, uh, including uh, deputy chief of staff uh, for policy and cabinet affairs uh, to Premier W. McGinty. Uh, he worked at Metrolinx as a vice president on issues of strategy and communications. And he's also got some interesting experience in the federal government as well. So uh, I, uh, you know, the team uh, that John has pulled together is really a fantastic team. Part of the mission of Evergreen City Works is, I'm just going to read a statement from their, you know, what they do, uh, from transportation to uh, housing to city building. Um, we experiment with new ideas and build coalitions behind them to ensure their adoption. And uh, you know, I can't really think of someone better than John to, to build these kinds of coalitions. And uh, when we first approached his team about partnering with this event, uh, you know, sort of immediately enthusiastic, and uh, the team really hasn't disappointed. So they've you know, provided the, the space, the food, the AV, and a fantastic team of volunteers to help uh, for this event. So I'm just going to turn it over to John to, to give some welcoming remarks. Great. So welcome to my office. Uh, it 
is, it is one of the great spaces in Toronto, having spent 10 years in government. Uh, there's something about sitting, I, I, my office is on the third floor looking into the, into the valley, and I'm often on the phone with uh, the Premier's office or the Mayor's office, and they, sit, and they say to me, sorry, where are you right now? I'm hearing some strange, no strange noises in the background. I'm like, oh, there's a kid's camp, and they're chasing each other through the valley right now, and I think one, one group just caught the other group, and they're cheering. And, so it's a very uh, unique and, and wonderful place to live. So if you haven't been here before, please take time to wander around. It's a very active day. Uh, there's an amazing farmer's market, the best cinnamon buns on the planet. Truly unhealthy and, and wonderful. Uh, Alex gave a brief overview of Evergreen City Works. But we, we really try and do two, uh, we, we have kind of three things we do. Uh, one is we build large multi-sector collaborations around difficult ideas. Uh, so there's, uh, we do a very large amount of public transit finance, called Move to GTHA, and we're currently doing a uh, very large amount on housing affordability and sustainability, called the GTA Housing Action Lab. Uh, and the goal is to really um, help government go where it wants to go and can't do it because of political reasons or, or lack of citizen engagement. Um, another one uh, our big projects that, that I think links directly to what you're doing is, is a national uh, campaign we're currently running called We Are Cities. Uh, and if you have time, go to wearecities.ca and check it out. It, it is uh, a national attempt to develop with citizens an, an urban agenda for the country. So I worked uh, before the province with John Godfrey on the New Deal for Cities. And uh, one of the things I've seen over my 10 years in the federal and provincial government is uh, they have more money, and particularly the federal government has more money than it has responsibilities, and the cities are the exact opposite. And I'll give you one stat that just keeps getting stuck in my brain, uh, that cities collect between 8 and 12 cents of every tax dollar, uh, but currently hold 50% of all public infrastructure assets. We have a, a serious imbalance, and one of the, the things I think articulates it best is if you actually look at the Constitution, that assigns uh, cities to as creatures of the province. It sits perfectly in the Constitution between us, um, the federal government having assigned uh, asylums and saloons. So it's asylums, cities, saloons, <laughs> <and> responsibility, <laughs> these uh, responsibility those values. And it's, so it's just funny how it was perceived when they actually created this and how ridiculous it seems now that 80% of our population lives in cities. Uh, so we've had uh, 60 roundtables across the country in 30 cities, all provinces and territories are represented. Uh, we have 10 organizations partnering with us uh, on the ground across the country to deliver this national agenda. Please go to the website, submit your ideas. We have 800 ideas that have already been submitted and we're uh, frantically trying to, to wade through those to make something coherent out of it. Uh, we hope to launch this agenda in the next six months uh, to inform the discussions around uh, the federal election and, and beyond. Um, and we think one of the things that, you know, one of the criticisms I would say when, uh, when we go out and talk about this campaign is people say, oh, come on, why are you going to give the money to municipalities? They'll just waste it. And, and I, I say having worked at the federal and provincial uh, levels, uh, the municipality by no means has a monopoly on wasting uh, money. It, it's, uh, everyone has their challenges, everyone has their political realities, and I think, uh, as, as far as I've seen, the municipal level is, is extremely sophisticated, and especially here. Um, but it needs this kind of work, it needs uh, this kind of accountability, um, this citizen engagement, this new way of thinking around participatory budgeting and data and technology uh, that you guys are engaging in today. So I just want to say, as, as I look to the kind of bigger picture of this national agenda, when Alex came to me and said, you know, we're doing this thing, we wanted to partner because we actually really want to learn from today about key things that should be in this national urban agenda that we're pushing uh, and also be able to support this work going forward because we think it's critical to building up uh, the sophistication, the innovation uh, within the municipal budgeting processes. I think that's going to bring citizens along uh, to enable us to give municipalities the resources they, they need to deliver on infrastructure and all these different things that are in the municipal world. So. Have a wonderful day. I look forward to seeing the outcomes of it. Thank you for letting us be involved in this day, uh, and we look forward to seeing the results. Great. Thank you so much, John. Um, so before we get started, I just want to say a little bit about
about better budget to you, the genesis of um, our initiative. So, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to get involved with this is I had the opportunity and privilege to, to work on a number of provincial budgets. And before I had that experience, I hadn't really thought that much about budgeting. Uh, you know, budgets were something that kind of came up in the media every once in a while and were interesting to learn about, but, um, you know, I didn't really know how they work. And that was after having spent a lot of time, you know, studying political science and studying law and studying all these things that you think would give you some insight into how resources are allocated in uh, public institutions. And, you know, the fact is, you know, over 40% of our economy is government spending. And that government spending is allocated, for the most part, uh, through budget processes. And yet it's, it's kind of a democratic institution that's not that well understood. So a big part of the impetus behind this was to say, you know what, let's try and do something within our city. And this was also at a time when there was some, um, you know, interesting things happening at City Hall. Um, to get people more engaged in understanding how budgets work and in trying to basically improve uh, the process by which uh, resources are allocated. So the mission of Better Budget TO is really around improving the way Toronto manages public money with a real focus on engaging the public in budgeting. And our vision is really a Toronto where um, our city is looked upon as a, as a world leader in, in public budgeting. Um, there's lots of interesting work being done around the world and you know, we'd really like Toronto to be used as an example uh, of how things can be done uh, well from an open, democratic, and evidence-based uh, point of view. So we started around uh, 2012, uh, but it's really part of what I would say is a global movement around open democratic budgeting. So just to give you a couple of examples of organizations, there's a great organization called the Open Budget, Budget Partnership, which among other things publishes an index of countries around the world in terms of how open and democratic their budget processes are. And they've got a great bank of resources about civil society organizations around the world doing interesting work in this space. There's an example of a report from the Ukraine, which I found this morning. Its title is actually kind of similar to the report that we uh, published today. Um, open Spending is a really interesting group uh, around uh, open data and information around public spending. And uh, there's a group in the US called Results for America, which is dedicated to evidence-based budgeting, which we kind of came about in the last couple of years. And I think we can expect to see more of this kind of work. And you know, we, we really are sort of part of that ecosystem. So since 2012, we've done a couple of things. Uh, we published a consultation paper last winter, which put out about 24 ideas for improving the uh, budget process in uh, the city. And that was based on our first Better Budget Day, which was an engagement event, which I think a number of you participated in. We generated uh, ideas uh, for, uh, for that agenda. Uh, we've held five workshops across different parts of the city. We've done uh, some uh, media interviews and op-eds on, on places like Metro Morning and Toronto Star on ideas like participatory budgeting and this agenda for reforming uh, the budget process. So it's really ideas and engagement has been, has been our focus uh, so far. And we're basically a 100% volunteer run initiative. Uh, we're not sort of an official nonprofit organization. It's, it's kind of a, a group of interested uh, citizens and volunteers who've been doing uh, this work and we've been very lucky to benefit from you know, their volunteer time and skill. I think our own you know, budget uh, is, is quite small. Um, if you're talking about budgets, and we've benefited from partnerships with you know, groups like uh, Evergreen City Works and the Wellesley Institute to help make events like this uh, possible. So I want to give a little bit of a quick overview of kind of budgets 101 in Toronto, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I recognize that there are different levels of knowledge in the room. There's some people with a huge amount of experience and some folks who are new to budgets, and I think it's important that we do a little bit of, of level setting. So I guess the first point to make is that city budgets are really quite different from provincial and federal budgets. And um, a big part of that difference is that they're open. And that early on in the budget process, you know, a draft budget gets presented to the public that's not final. And that the public, uh, elected officials and stakeholders have a chance to uh, debate. Uh, whereas the federal and provincial budget is basically a document that's presented in the legislature as more or less final. I mean, there are debates that committee and in the House, but it's very rare that there are major changes to the budget after it's introduced. So part of why we decided to focus on the city level is there's a real opportunity to use that openness to improve it even further, whereas the provincial and federal budget process, I think, arguably are a little bit harder to change and to democratize, not to say that there isn't lots of room for improvement there as well. 
Um, so that's one of the big, uh, the big differences. Also in the provincial and federal process, you know, they can run deficits. The city has to balance the budget by law every year. It's part of the constitutional framework that John talked about at the beginning. And that makes a, a big impact, obviously. Um, you, know, you see these pie charts all the time. The city's budget, um, from an operating perspective, is about $11.5 billion. And this is just a little bit of a breakdown of where the money goes. Uh, the city actually has a, a couple of, of different budgets. There's what's called the tax-supported budget, and then there's what's called the, the rate-supported budget. And uh, the rate-supported budget includes things like uh, water uh, and solid waste that's paid for out of basically fees and rates you pay for those things. And this slide combines the two of those things, because from our perspective, I think it's useful for a budget as a whole, even though there are actually kind of four different, different budgets at the city. So this gives you a little bit of a sense of, of where, where the money goes. Uh, obviously, TTC is a major item. Water is a major item. Policing, you hear about those items. Uh, sometimes the most visible things in the city that you know, citizens really value, things like libraries or parks and rec, uh, it's actually quite a small percentage of the budget, so it's important to keep that in mind as well. So that's the operating budget, basically the day-to-day -day expenses of the city for running uh, city services. And you also have the capital budget, and the city budgets uh, on a 10-year basis, so every year they present the plan for basically infrastructure spending for the next 10 years. And this gives a little bit of a breakdown of $32 billion uh, of spending. And again, one of the things that's not often known, I think people have an appreciation that transportation and transit is really important, uh, but also the water infrastructure is a major, major piece uh, of that infrastructure spending, and the upkeep of that is quite, uh, quite significant. So this gives you a little bit of a sense, you know, TTC is a big item. Transportation, which includes all sorts of road repair and construction. Uh, the Scarborough subway, a, uh, a major item, as well as the Spadina subway. Um, so the 10-year capital budget, which is refreshed every year. And then the sources of revenue. So this is the sources of revenue for the operating budget uh, for the city. And the one we often hear about is property taxes, which is about a third of the sources of revenue. Um, unlike other levels of government, the city doesn't have a lot of revenue tools compared to the province. It's, uh, it's much, much less. So highly dependent on property taxes. Uh, quite dependent on money from the provincial and federal governments, especially the provincial government. And because the city delivers a lot of programs that are mandated by the provincial government, often people will say that there isn't a lot of flexibility uh, for the city to do things around the budget. Uh, user fees is a major item. So if you combine that in the water and waste rates, Although people talk a lot about the property tax, uh, changes in those other rates have a big impact on people and on services as well. And so that's been one of the contrasts over the last couple of years. The property tax rates, uh, and, or the, the yearly increases in property taxes have been you know, relatively low. Uh, the yearly increases in things like the, the water rates, for example, uh, have been fairly high in some cases you know, in the 9% uh, range. Uh, and then you have items like the land transfer tax and uh, the use of, of reserves uh, as, as other items as part of the budget, but much, much less diverse than the, um, the problems. And I think another important thing to note is that with respect to property taxes, the city basically has to make a conscious decision each year to raise the amount of revenue from property taxes that, come, that comes in. It doesn't automatically grow uh, with the economy um, in contrast to something like a sales tax or an income tax in the problems, which basically the revenues coming into the province of the federal government rise at the rate of economic growth, and they don't have to make a conscious decision and tell the public, we're raising your taxes, um, because the rate stays the same, but the amount of revenue comes in uh, and grows. Um, so what is the state of the city's finances? I think you know, sometimes, especially over the last years, there's been quite a bit of um, debate over that. You know, I would say that um, there's not a fiscal crisis at the city, and the city has a, a good credit rating. It's able to borrow money at reasonable rates. And by law, as mentioned earlier, the budget does have to be balanced every year. Uh, but there are some major challenges in terms of financing the future needs of the city, in terms of you know, large infrastructure uh, deficits and uh, large amounts of repair and things like housing and uh, transit that need to be done that aren't uh, necessarily budgeted for. And uh, you know, the city's revenue tools are, are limited. Of government, given the level of responsibility, as John mentioned earlier, that the city has. So these are challenges that come up in every budget process that will continue to come up, um, but uh, I don't think it's fair to say that the city is on a, a fiscal cliff or anything like that. Um, you know, um, the, uh, 
the, the ability to continue to, 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 to do more of this is, is definitely there. Um, quick overview of the budget process and how that works. I think the, the process that people tend to see is a process that usually starts in late November or early December, which is when the city staff present a draft budget, which is basically staff recommendations on the basis of a sense of where the, you know, the mayor and the council want to go, uh, but that needs to be refined through input from council stakeholders and the public. Uh, but before that happens, there's a long process in which the uh, city manager's office, the CFO's office, all the different city departments prepare their own budgets and submit them for uh, review mm -hmm. and, and approval as part of the draft budget. And that's an important part as well, because obviously there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into preparing those draft budgets and setting the priorities. So that's the, the work that happens between April and November. Once the staff recommended budget is introduced, there's a process of review through various different committees of city council and city council itself. So it goes through the budget committee, it goes uh, to the executive committee, and then it's eventually adopted by uh, city council, um, usually subject to some changes uh, based on consultation, hearings, and decisions that are made by uh, councillors. Um, so where to learn more? There's actually a lot of information available on the City of Toronto website. If you're curious about the budget, you can basically go and download any analyst note from any city uh, department with lots and lots of information. Here's one example from Transportation Services, which is a 70-page note. You can get access to all of the presentations that city councilors have access to as part of the budget process. Here's an example of a, you know, a really detailed slide presentation. And um, all that information is available. So it's one of the really neat things about a city budget is, you know, if you try to get that information about the provincial budget, you can get the final budget, but you're not getting the briefing notes. All that stuff is, is, is confidential once you file a freedom of information request. So lots of opportunities to learn more. And, you know, I do want to recognize there's some city staff today who worked on this. They made a real effort, I think, to make the information clearer, more accessible, and uh, you know, that's an ongoing effort, obviously, but uh, lots of work has been done. So that's a little bit of background about the, um, the budget process. Um, I also, we've also got a, a, another, welcome. we're, we're going we're to transition to our, our panel about the politics of budgeting, uh, but we've got a, a welcome from a, a special guest who actually knows quite a lot about uh, the politics of budgeting. So I've got a little video that I think we're just going to roll uh, now to, to welcome folks. 